During the Gilded Age, one of the defining characteristics of the period was the unpleasant relationship between workers and big business. Common worker-led arguments included topics such as the eight-hour movement to prevent overworking, unfair wage disputes, and protests against harmful workplace conditions. Due to these disparities, workers began to form labor unions and go on strikes. However, unlike today's age, disputes between workers and capitalists often ended in violence rather than peaceful mediation. In fact, big business commonly used their wealth and insider relationship within the government to extend the use of armed forces in an attempt to shut down labor unions and strikes. There was no better example of this than the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Leading up to the strike was the Panic of 1873, where a five-year period of economic contraction was met with decreasing wages and rising unemployment. By 1877, this downturn was experienced in almost every industry, including the railroads. In particular, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company cut their workers' wages three times in 1877 alone, which led to the initial strike in Martinsburg, West Virginia. The striking workers refused to let trains operate in response to the wage cuts. Meanwhile, the capitalists running the show failed to exhibit any signs of potential cooperation. Governor Henry Matthew of West Virginia immediately called for federal troops to stop the strikers and restore full operation of the railways. In the subsequent days, railroad strikes popped up across the country. Laborers in Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Missouri continued to go on strike as wages were cut as much as 10%. In Baltimore, Maryland, the first case of violence in the Great Railroad Strike took place on July 20th when the president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad John Work Garrett petitioned the governor of Maryland, John Lee Carroll, to call upon the National Guard and appease the situation with striking workers. As they marched through Mount Vernon, the Maryland National Guard was greeted with hostility from workers and anti-capitalists alike. They ultimately fired their weapons into the crowd and killed 10 people, while leaving many others wounded. Similarly, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Governor John Hartranft also called in the Pennsylvania National Guard as strikers destroyed trains and tracks as well as set fire to various buildings. An estimated 40 people died as the Pennsylvania National Guard fired at strikers with the aid of federal forces sent by President Rutherford B. Hayes. However, the Reading Railroad Massacre may be the most interesting case of them all. Not only did the Reading Railroad Massacre include the Pennsylvania National Guard and local police force, but also the Pinkerton Private Security and Detective Agency which acted as a militia for hire. This was one of the first times where wealth accumulation from capitalism was used to hire armed forces. In reference to the armed forces in Reading, the New York Times newspaper reported just how brutal the massacre was. Few were aware of their arrival in the city, and fewer still knew they were advancing upon the crowd. Steadily, they approached when suddenly 300 rifles were discharged in volleys and five men dropped to the pavement. The report that troops had fired blank cartridges is therefore incorrect. When the troops fired their first volleys, they were given broadsides of rocks and stones from the tops of walls. Quite a number of revolver shots were returned by parties in the crowd. The troops continued their firing, and men, women, and children fled in fear. In totality, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 resulted in more than 100 people dead and over 1,000 arrested. However, capitalists were quick to justify their actions, claiming that the workers' labor supply indicated new hires were willing to work at lower wages. A report from the president and managers of Philadelphia and Reading Railroad Company to stockholders stated that 380 engineers and an equal number of firemen quit work, and their places were immediately supplied by others who were anxious to obtain the situations and who have generally turned out to be worthy and efficient men. Furthermore, Despite their inflexibility with worker negotiations, capitalists were quick to pass blame to the strikers. Aided by the active participation of others, a riotous mob was excited to the acts of incendiarism and outrage against the property of the company at Reading, which resulted in the burning of several freight cars in the fine bridge of the Lebanon Valley branch. Overall, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 failed on what was set out to be accomplished. Wages continued to get cut and armed forces were able to fully restore the operational capability of railroads across the country as workers were only met with violence. 
News writer David Bendan of Harper's Weekly best summarized the situation in 1877. The reign of terror inaugurated by the railroad strikers in Baltimore on the morning of the 16th of July is unexampled in the history of strikes in this country. Scenes of riot and bloodshed accompanied it such as we have never before witnessed in the uprising of labor against capital. Commerce has been obstructed, industries have been paralyzed, hundreds of lives sacrificed, and millions of dollars worth of property destroyed by lawless mobs.